Hello everyone, I am the Magic Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews under the deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, Satoru Umezawa. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing, which also helps out a lot. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Satoru Umazawa is a 2-4 human ninja for 1 generic, 1 blue, and 1 black. He has a triggered ability that happens when you activate a ninjutsu ability. You look at the top 3 cards of your library, put one into your hand, and bottom deck the other two. This bypasses actual draw, so it won't be prevented by abilities that stop you from drawing. The only drawback is that it can only be triggered once per turn. However, that isn't the main reason for building Satoru, to me at least. This is not a ninja tribal deck. This deck aims to make the most of Satoru giving creature cards in your hand ninjutsu, meaning that for just 2 generic, 1 blue, and 1 black, we can essentially cheat in any creature in our hand. Granted, it has to be with an attacker that wasn't blocked, but this is a blue-black deck. There are plenty of unblockable weenies in these colors. Since the deck is essentially sneaking in its fatties for just 4 mana, it's preferable that we swap them out for something super cheap to cast the first time and then cast back again in order for them to be able to attack the next turn. That's why the deck is obviously running Changeling Outcast, Trident Shore Stalker, Tormented Soul, Gruul Lurker, Miss Cloak Herald, Slither Blade, and Invisible Stalker. With the exception of Invisible Stalker that costs 2, the rest of these cost only 1 mana. Granted, the Stalker makes up for it by having Hexproof, but being able to drop one of these the first turn is super clutch, because then we get Satoru on turn 3 and then by turn 4 we're ninjutsuing in a fatty, and these creatures are completely unblockable. Kaito Shizuki is included for the same reason. His minus 2 creates an unblockable 1-1 one, one ninja token that we can also use to ninjutsu in a fatty. We do lose the token, but that's fine. Kaito's other abilities are great as well. His plus 1 draws us a card, but we have to discard a card unless we attack that turn, which is usually always going to be the case. Even his ultimate is busted in this deck. If we manage to get his emblem, then every time one of our creatures deals combat damage to an opponent, we get to look through our library for a black or blue creature card and cheat it directly onto the battlefield. That's super busted given all the unblockable weenies in this deck. We don't even need to ninjutsu our fatties in at that point, we could just cheat them in with Kaido's emblem. Kaido is so epic that he even protects himself the first time, he has a triggered ability that phases him out at the end of the turn when he first entered. Super cool. Going back to the deck's other unblockable creatures, it's running Dothy Voidwalker, Thalakos Seer, Wei Scout, Wu Scout, and Wu Light Cavalry. While these aren't outright unblockable, the chances of any of our opponents running creatures with Shadow or Horsemanship is low enough to make these nigh unblockable. There's also good beyond being unblockable true drops. Dothy Voidwalker is busted in its own right. It exiles any cards that would go to an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, and then you could tap it and sacrifice it to play any card with a void counter for free. The deck has plenty of other effects similar to this one, but we'll see them in a bit. Thalako Seer is synergistic as well since we draw a card whenever it leaves the battlefield, so we return it to our hand when ninjutsuing in something for it, we draw a card. Super good. Wu Scout has us look at an opponent's hand whenever it enters a battlefield, so each time we ninjutsu it in and out, or we cast it, we can look at an opponent's hand and then know which is the better one to swing into depending on what interaction they have in hand. Swan Shuan, Lord of Wu, and Archetype of Imagination are included because they just outright make all of our creatures seemingly unblockable. Again, not entirely unblockable because Swan Shuan won't stop them from blockers with horsemanship and the Archetype won't stop them from blockers with reach, but as I mentioned earlier, the odds of that happening are very low. So these essentially make our entire army nigh unblockable, which presents a potential win con in and of itself via Alpha Strike. Rogue's Passage and Shijo Death Storehouse can also provide evasion, all while not taking up a slot in the deck. The former is a bit expensive to activate at 4 in tapping, but it's outright unblockability. The latter gives slight evasion via fear, but it does only cost 1 black and tapping to activate. So, and if an opponent doesn't have any black and or artifact creatures, that creature is as good as unblockable. Creeping Tar Pit is another card that doesn't take up a slot in the deck, but it does enter the battlefield tap. But that's okay because it can tap for either blue or black, plus, more importantly, it can be transformed into an unblockable creature. So this one's essentially a freebie. Blinkmok Nessus and Inkmok Nessus are included because flying isn't decent enough as far as evasion goes, plus they don't take up a slot in the deck. Plus, Inkmok Nessus can potentially take out an opponent via poison counters. Speaking of taking out opponents via infect counters, let's look at what we can cheat in with Satoru giving all of our creatures ninjutsu. Blightseal Colossus is the go-to win con everybody's expecting. 
Yes, it's definitely worth including since it's an automatic KO, assuming it connects and no one hits it with Path to Exile or Source to Plowshares in response, but it's still an RKO style player eliminator. The deck does have other ways of getting the win, which we'll soon see, but this one's the most obvious one. So with that out of the way, let's move on. Jin Gitaxius, Core Augur, Consecrated Sphinx, Phyllis, Broker of Blood, and Deep Fathom Skulker are some nice choices when it comes to what to sneak attack in thanks to Satoru. While these are all very powerful creatures, what they have most in common is card advantage. Jin Gitaxius has us draw 7 cards during our end step while reducing our opponent's maximum hand size by 7. The Sphinx has us draw 2 cards for each card our opponents draw, which is super busted in the early game. Villas can also potentially get rid of any creature minus 1 minus 1 at a time, all while drawing us cards. The Eldrazi synergizes amazingly with the deck since we draw a card off of each of our creatures dealing combat damage to an opponent. With so many unblockable weenies in the deck, you can already imagine how many cards this will help us draw into. As a bonus, we can also pay 3 generic and 1 colorless to make a creature unblockable. Speaking of drawing cards from our creatures dealing combat damage, Biden of Thassa, Coastal Piracy, and Reconnaissance Mission have the same effect as Deep Fathom Skulker and can really add up when multiples of them are in play. The enchantments all cost 2 generic and 2 blue to cast, so we can get them out relatively early. What's important about these is that it helps our invisible weenies draw into these fatties that we want to ninja 2 in, while also drawing us into our responses and interaction, which we'll see later on. Grasalax Ultralit Scholar is another way to turn our combat damage into card advantage, but it's only limited per opponent instead of creature. It's still good to include even if not as powerful because it can also help us bounce any creature that gets blocked, allowing us to then ninjutsu them back in at later turns. Thought Vessel and Relicory Tower are included because of how many cards we can draw with this deck. In fact, they're super helpful because Jin Gitaxius has us draw a new hand during our end step but does not increase our maximum hand size. So these definitely come in handy. Patron of the Moon is another great fatty to cheat in to help us with our hand size too. If we're drawing into a ton of cards and end up with some lands in hand, for just one generic we can put up to two lands from our hand onto the battlefield. This can really set us ahead, potentially even further than some green decks since we draw into so many cards. Being able to drop all of our lands in is no joke. Being a 5-4 with flying is also quite the bonus too. Runescar Demon and Razaketh the Foulblooded take it a little further by straight up tutoring instead of drawing. The deck has a couple of win cons via combo or beatdown besides Blightsteel Colossus. But tutoring for Blightsteel Colossus is a surefire way to take out an opponent from the game. But we can also tutor for any combo pieces, counter magic, Swen Shuan, etc. They're also beaters in their own right too, helping us win by beatdown much faster. As for some of the deck's interaction, Shieldred Whispering 1, Toxra the Corrosive, Duplicant, Meteor Golem, and Archon of Cruelty provide that via a beefy body. Shieldred not only has our opponent sacrifice a creature during their upkeep, but also helps us reanimate a creature during our own. Toxual is incredibly oppressive in a multiplayer environment. With just one turn around the table, we've already given our opponents creatures four slime counters and thus made them negative four, negative four, which might be enough to kill off most of them. Then those deaths gives us slug tokens, which we can use as sacrifice spotter to Toxual to dark cards or to Rasaketh to tutor for our win cons. Duplicate and Meteor Golem are pretty straightforward given that they have an enter the battlefield trigger, which we can potentially reuse if we bounce them with Ninja Swing in something else. The Archon is potentially the best of these though, since we draw a card and gain 3 life when it enters the battlefield, while an opponent has to sacrifice a creature or planeswalker, and then discard a card and lose 3 life. This is also part of one of the combo based win cons, which we'll soon see how to assemble. Void Winnerer also provides interaction by preventing interaction. Sometimes the best offense is a good defense. Preventing our opponents from casting spells with even casting costs not only prevents most board wipes from being cast, but most mana rocks as well, since most of them cost either 0 or 2 to cast, so getting this early on is quite harrowing for our opponents. However, sometimes the best way to get rid of something is to steal it altogether. Herald of Leshrac and Agent of Treachery do just that. Contributing to the flavor of the deck, these creatures help us steal resources from our opponents in the worst way possible. They're a lands. Getting the Herald early on is super oppressive because we steal a land per each counter on it. In a multiplayer game, this won't be that big of an issue since there will be plenty of lands to steal. Unfortunately, we do have to return them if it leaves the battlefield, but we'll probably have enough lands to win the game by then. The Agent steals permanence when it enters the battlefield, so if we're able to bounce it and then cheat it back in via Nijutsu multiple times, potentially in the same turn, opponents might just scoop in response, giving us the win anyways. Lord of the Void, Mind Leech Mass, Silent Blade Oni, Fallen Shinobi, Nashi, Moon Sage's Scion, and Arvinox, the Mind Flail are some more thievery effects in the deck. These aren't as busted as the previous two, but can still get the job done. The first four do it for free, but Nashi can also potentially do it for free if you're willing to spend life for its mana value. 
Arbanox isn't so bad since it does exile the bottom card of each opponent's library, so we do have three choices to play from, and using mana as any color to cast them. It's also a 9-9 if we control three permanents we don't own, which isn't that big of a drawback with this deck. Keep in mind that if you do ninjutsu in Arbanox while you do not control three permanents you don't own, it's simply a tapped enchantment and not a creature, so it won't deal any damage to the defending player. Rogue's class also has a similar effect but it does have to be level 3. That being said, level 1 is still exiling cards from the top of an opponent's library, and level 2 gives our creatures some form of evasion, even if it's not as good as Shadow or Horsemanship, it is better than nothing. Glassbow Mimic is another interesting creature to use, but for later on. For just 3 mana we can copy our best creature, which is potentially one of those non-legendary fatties we ninjutsued in. Best of all, this card is included here because it doesn't take up a slot in the deck. Its backside is a land. Granted, it does enter the battlefield tapped, but there's no reason not to run it here, especially when for 3 mana we can copy Blightsteel Colossus, Runescarred Demon, etc. While the deck can very easily win via beatdown since we are ninjutsuing in big creatures, we're also potentially stealing or killing off potential blockers. We're also potentially making our entire board unblockable with Senshuan and Archetype of Imagination. But the deck already has quite a few straight up unblockable creatures too. Strixhaven Stadium shines here thanks to that. While Blightsteel Colossus is something that everyone's going to expect, we can still one-shot an opponent out of the game with this mana rock. Once it has 10 counters, any opponent we hit is eliminated from the game. You'd be surprised how often this wins me games in my Marisi Brick of the Coil deck and my Edric Spymaster of Trust deck. A Trot of the Silencer is another way to eliminate an opponent from the match, while also simultaneously getting rid of their creatures. Atrada has built-in unblockability, so we can take advantage of how the combat phase is broken down in order to bypass her downside. Whenever she deals combat damage to a player, she triggers, exiling one of their creatures, but then she has to be shuffled back in. However, in response to her trigger, since she's still technically an unblocked attacker, we can ninjutsu something else in her place. Her trigger resolves, exiling the creature with a hit counter, but Atrada is no longer on the battlefield to be shuffled back into our library. We can then repeat this in subsequent turns until we kill off that opponent. Now, if these two methods seem slower compared to Blightsteel Colossus, that's okay. You can either run both of them in your deck. These two make it a bit more fair than with Blightsteel, plus they're way cheaper. So you can build accordingly. However, the deck can also win via an infinite combo by taking advantage of how ninjutsu works. All you need is Palancron and Silver for Master. These cards are already amazing on their own in the deck. Palancron can be ninjutsued in for 4 mana and then it untaps 7 lands when it enters, giving us a net gain in mana. The Rat Ninja reduces ninjutsu costs by 1 generic. So this makes Satoru give our creature cards a ninjutsu cost of just 1 generic, 1 blue and 1 black. However, together, along with Satoru, we can generate infinite mana. Let's see how. Let's say we attack with an unblockable creature. We can then ninjutsu Palancron in for just 3 mana. It enters untapping 7 lands, which we tap down for 7 mana. Since Palancron is now attacking and untapped, we can ninjutsu in any other creature for just 3 mana. We'll always have a creature to ninjutsu in because it was the one ninjutsu's out for Palancron. That creature is now an untapped attacker. We can then spend 3 mana to ninjutsu Palancron back in. Notice that we generated 7 mana, but only use 6 in this loop. We can do this indefinitely many times until we generate infinite mana. With infinite mana, we can use whatever outlet to win. For example, infinitely ninjutsuing in and out Archon of Cruelty. This will have opponents lose 3 life until they all die. We can also ninjutsu in any of our tutors on a body like Runescar Demon. If we don't already have our win con, we can just tutor for it. We can also infinitely ninjutsu in and out creatures like Agent of Treachery and steal everyone's permanence. That might get us the win due to your opponent's scooping. There's plenty to do with this loop for sure, and not only is it not hard to assemble, but all of the pieces work well on their own. You can also achieve this loop with Great Whale instead of Palancron in case it's too expensive for you. Either way, Palancron's benefit is that it can bounce itself for 4 mana. But in this case, we're bouncing it back and forth with Ninjutsu, so Great Whale is just as good. Or you can just run them both in the deck as well. The following cards in the deck are the essential card advantage, responses, and mana acceleration of any deck. One way of making the most of always having unblocked attackers is to get some much needed combat damage triggers, particularly from effects like Larceny. What a better way to deal with opponent's interaction than by disallowing them from keeping any card in the first place. An opponent without cards in hand is as good as a sitting duck. And this does the job here in spades. Cyclonic Rift and Altawara Soaring City also helps along the same vein by bouncing things back to opponent's hands. In any case, overloading Cyclonic Rift will also leave their battlefield clear for any alpha strikes, so that's also key to the deck. But bouncing all things to their hand and then attacking with Larceny on the battlefield is incredibly oppressive. Otawara doesn't even take up a slot on the deck, which is just crazy, and we can even use it on our own permanents in a pinch. 
Fierce Guardianship, Pact of Negation, Swan Song, Negate, Counterspell, and Mana Drain are obviously included. We don't need that big a Counterspell suite since most of the fatties we're ninjutsuing in are interaction on a body, but these are still good enough to have. We draw into the deck enough that we can potentially always have one in hand. Mystic Sanctuary is also included just for that. We can fetch this in instant speed in response to drawing a card if we want to be extra sneaky like that. We are piloting Satoru Umezawa, so we might as well, right? Speaking of Satoru, Lightning Greaves, Swift Foot Boots, and Nurok's Stealth Suit are included to protect him since he is such a key piece to the deck. However, he only costs 3 to cast the first time, so it's not that backbreaking to cast him multiple times in a game. That being said, the best of these is Nurok's Stealth Suit since we can attach it at instant speed for just double blue. You'd be surprised how many opponents overlook that when pointing their interaction at your board. As for getting us there, Sword of the Animus and Sword of Hearth and Home are a given. Yes, we're ninjutsuing out that unblockable weenie, but at least Sword of the Animus triggers on attack and not combat damage. But having either of these equipped to an unblockable creature means ramping for a basic land each turn, which is super epic for a non-green deck like this one. The sword also blinks a creature as a bonus, which is great since plenty of creatures in the deck haven't entered the battlefield trigger. Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Demir Signet, and Talisman of Dominance are the deck's ubiquitous mana rocks and really have no further explanation than the deck isn't green, so it needs them. That being said, mana really isn't an issue in the deck since Satoru helps us cheat in our creatures for just 4 mana. The rest of the deck is just Dearth of the Lands. The deck's running all 7 fetch lands, Watery Grave, Sunken Hollow, Feeded Pools, Ice Tunnel, Tainted Isle, Drowned Catacombs, Sunken Ruins, Shipwreck Marsh, Reflecting Pool, Command Tower, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 4 of each basic land due to the basic land ramp the deck is able to accomplish with the previously mentioned pair of swords. As always, you can edit the mana base of this deck per your budget, whether increasing it or decreasing it. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Satoru Umezawa. You can build this deck literally however you want. You could do it Ninja Tribal or with any other creature you want it cheated onto the battlefield. I wanted to keep it a bit flavorful even if there aren't many ninjas in it. But true to the theme of the Kamigawa Underworld, the deck is sneaky and thievish. So I at least wanted to go with that theme for it. In any case, this deck was voted on by the viewers, so I hope this gave you some ideas for your own Satoru Umezawa build. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. I'd also like to thank the viewers who voted for this video. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Benedict Kirby, and happy brewing.